and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Temley Thompson, and boy, do we have some great videos to show you from all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, including Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park this week. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you the latest and greatest of all the great footage that the guides have been shooting throughout the week here at Eco Tour Adventures. Then you're gonna have a chance to win our trivia question of the week for a gift card to our Eco Tour store. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So if you have a wildlife biology, naturalist, or related question, go ahead and ask it in the comments section. I'd also love to know where everybody's joining us from, so do let me know that is in the comments section as well. Let's start this week with grizzly bears, because everybody knows we all love grizzly bears, right? Let's check in with Seth, who had a great encounter with a big, large, probably male bear. Hi everyone, Seth Latka here with Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures, and uh, hope everyone's having a great day. I know I am. Um, I'm just uh, tuning in with you guys to tell you a little bit about this uh, awesome sighting we had of an adult grizzly in Grand Teton National Park. Now my guess is that this grizzly is uh, potentially a male. Uh, it's hard to tell, but he's kind of on the heavier side. Lots of the bears are looking really fit right now because um, they're in hyperphagia where they're consuming up to 20,000 calories a day. Um, down here in the Grand Teton National Park, our grizzlies range from kind of three to 500 pounds, males kind of at the higher end of that, and our black bears two to 400 pounds, once again, males at the higher range. Uh, when you get up into areas like Alaska, you can have a 1,200 pound grizzly, and that's all about diet and geographic location. Um, so up there, they have the salmon run. They're um, getting more protein intake than our bears down here. The bears in Grand Teton National Park have been documented to uh, munch on 200 plus species of plants and animals. So they aren't just fishing, they aren't just eating berries, they aren't just hunting elk cows. There's a whole bunch of different things that they can feed on. Um, so they're a little bit smaller because uh, less protein intake than the bears up in Alaska. And then also um, proximity to the equator. So a general rule of thumb is the farther you are away from the equator, the larger the animals are. And this makes sense. Um, lar farther away from the equator, it's colder, and so um, it's beneficial for animals to be larger so they can maintain their body heat and stay warm. Um, so our moose down here, you know, max out around 1,100 pounds. You can get a 2,000 pound Alaskan Yukon moose um, up north. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the footage. Hope you guys come out and join us. Um, there's tons of things to see out here. We have all the aspens and cottonwoods changing colors, so it's a great time to come and visit. Pretty cool look at a really big, likely boar grizzly bear in Grand Teton National Park this week. But the other big news, of course, is what comes with our annual ritual of fall, which is the elk rut and their breeding season, and of course, the amazing bugling sounds that those bulls make. Let's check in with Eco Tour Adventures owner and guide Taylor and see what he has to say about that. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for joining us uh, for another episode of Wildlife Wednesday. Fall, uh, one of my favorite seasons of the year. I don't know, it, this place is amazing. I feel like the season that I'm in tends to be the favorite season of the year for myself. But one thing that really makes the fall special is the elk rut. mid-September through mid-October, um, kind of the height of the rut being around the, f the first of the month. Um, it's just an incredible spectacle. Um, a couple times this week I went out, um, personally once with my family, and we were rewarded um, with big bull elk um, communicating their strength and their fitness to other males that are nearby as well as the, the females. Um, so male elk, they, uh, they do their best to try to create a harem of females. You know, a harem could be anywhere from just, you know, half dozen female individuals. I've counted harems of, you know, upwards of 80 individuals. And that male, for a month period of time, is eating very little, sleeping very little. They are doing their best to keep their females kind of corralled into a tight ball or, 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 or network. 
Um, don't be fooled, though. Um, it's really the females that call the shot. Um, the females will kind of um, move across the landscape as they please, and the, the dominant bull of that harem will do their best to keep the subordinate males away, um, but then also to kind of keep the, the females in a, you know, in, in a, in a tight um, network. So yeah, we were watching here um, bulls bugling. Um, so the bugle is a loud vocalization um, and that's a way that they can advertise their health and fitness. Um, they also really enjoy displaying their antlers. So you might see that elk standing broadside you know, to the females, to another bull, um, showing their, their size and stature. Um, their, the elk, their neck does swell during this time of the year. Um, to, to emphasize their, their, their size. It's an incredible time of year. It's a very taxing time of year for these males. Um, because as the month goes on, like I said, they're eating very little and they're losing, you know, maybe 10, 15 percent of their body mass as they're going into the winter months. So that does make them more susceptible to predation, uh, disease, starvation um, as, as the winter progresses. And as spring comes around, uh, that does tend to be one of the more challenging times for many animals on this landscape. Um, we do see it's those most dominant bulls um, that often succumb to, to that long, drawn out winter in the Northern Rockies. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed this segment of uh, Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures Wildlife Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. There's nothing quite like that haunting noise that those bull elk make in the fall. If you ever get a chance to come out here into Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Park during our fall color season, it's just such a wonderful time for bears, it's a great time for wolves, and it's an amazing time for all of our running animals, which include moose, more on them next week, elk, pronghorn, all sorts of animals are in their breeding season, um, even mule deer and the like. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Now, I always neglect geology on these broadcasts, not because I don't love it, because I do, but because we always have such amazing wildlife action going on. So I asked our Ecotour naturalist, Mike Vanyan, to go up to Yellowstone National Park and show me a little bit about some of the guide's favorite geysers. Let's check in with him. In 2014, Yellowstone was named one of the seven natural wonders of North America. And what says Yellowstone more than Old Faithful? With an average height of 123.5 feet and erupting approximately every hour and a half, it is like no other site on the planet. But Yellowstone has much more to offer than just Old Faithful. Off the beaten path, there are all kinds of other geyser basins, like here at Fountain Paint Pot where we see fountain geyser, which has long periods, up to seven years of dormancy. And this summer has been on a regular schedule of four and a half to seven hours. So while last summer I rarely saw fountain geyser, this summer many tours have been able to enjoy the splendors of fountain geyser. And you're much closer than Old Faithful, and it lasts much longer than Old Faithful, so truly an intimate experience. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I think I should talk more about how geysers work. Of course, lakes, streams, and rivers are full of water. That water has time to percolate down into the earth. Now, usually underneath the Rocky Mountains, we have liquid hot magma at about 15 to 25 miles. Here in Yellowstone, however, that magma is only around two, two and a half miles below the surface. So this water comes in contact with that magma and has the chance to heat up. And of course, hot things rise. And of course, as it heats up, it also expands. So the water has to go somewhere and it comes boiling back up to the surface. We call them hot springs. Now, sometimes these hot springs have underground chambers. And sometimes these chambers have constrictions. So there's more water flowing into the chamber than can escape. Now many times on top of these systems, there are pools. 
pushing down on those chambers. And once the pressure in the chamber exceeds the pressure of the water pushing down from above, pop goes the top like a bottle of champagne and air goes rushing into these superheated, super pressurized systems, allowing all of that water to flash boil. And of course it expands exponentially and comes squirting out of the hole and into the sky as a geyser. Now of the 15,000 geothermals on the planet, over 10,000 of those are here in Yellowstone, like Great Fountain Geyser. Now of course, Great Fountain Geyser can shoot over 200 feet, which is much taller than Old Faithful. It can last much longer than Old Faithful. It spits out more water than Old Faithful. But unlike Old Faithful, which goes about every 90 minutes, Great Fountain can be hours of waiting. Steamboat Geyser, the largest geyser on the planet, can sometimes go 26 years with no eruptions. Recently, however, it has had record-shattering activity. Last year, some 32 times, Steamboat erupted. Also on the Grand Loop, which is included in our one-day Yellowstone tour, is the Mud Volcano and Sulphur Cauldron area, a very hot, dynamic, and acidic feature. Mud Volcano, along with the Dragon's Mouth, is really stinky. Smells like rotten eggs. Now, of the 26 Native American tribes that claim Yellowstone as part of their heritage, this Dragon's Mouth is believed to be where the people emerged from. Grand Geyser, which also shoots over 200 feet, is a sight like no other. Many have waited for hours, only to say that the 15 to 20 minute eruption is well worth the wait. Because again, you're much closer than Old Faithful. Riverside Geyser, with a bison in the background, is probably as iconic Yellowstone as you can possibly get. So I invite you to come up with Ecotour Adventures and see the hidden wonders that are right at your fingertips when on tour with us. So for all of you who've been looking for all that geyser footage, uh, I finally got back on the geyser train for you guys. We just take so much great footage of all the thermal features up in Yellowstone. And then somebody brings me some amazing grizzly footage and I got to choose between the two. So if there's something you'd like to see on our Wildlife Wednesday broadcast, let me know in the comment section. We do take requests. There was a request last week for more fox footage. The guides are on the case. We're going to get you guys some great foxes, hopefully next week. But in the meantime, I do want to check back in with Sarah Ern who just came back from another multi-day program uh, up in the northern range of Grand, of Grand Teton and then Yellowstone National Park, um, where she specifically works a little harder on wolves and grizzlies and focuses on those two species. But she did have a really neat classic Yellowstone scene that she wanted to talk to us a little bit about while she was out on her trip. Let's check in with her. Hello, this is Sarah Ernst, and we're here on a multi-day trip, and we decided to stop for a walk at the Fairy Falls Trailhead to Grand Prismatic, and we're greeted by a large bull bison right on the edge of a hot spring. Oftentimes when we're around the hot springs and the geysers, we'll see bison tracks and see bison scat, and people will ask us, do bison hang out near the hot springs? Well, definitely, yes, they do. There is a great benefit to coming here, especially in the wintertime when the deep snow makes it very challenging and costly for the bison to dig their way through the snow using those giant snow plow heads. Coming here to the hot springs, they can eke out a living on some of the grasses that grow near the, uh, the warm earth in the hot springs, requiring them to use a lot less energy to access it. But the bison do pay a price. They do occasionally fall through the crust and burn their legs or even um, end up immersed in the hot water, leading to their death. One of the dangers that this bison faces, in addition to the danger of breaking through and getting burned, is the steam that looks very harmless, but as it coats the grass with a thin layer of silica, so a, a sandy coating on top of this grass, it's gonna wear the enamel down on his teeth faster than the enamel will be worn down on a bison from Grand Teton National Park or from the northern part of Yellowstone. So the bison that spend the winter here can only do so thanks to the geothermal areas in the hot springs, but it comes at a price of a shorter lifespan because their teeth tend to give out a little bit earlier. This is Sarah Ernst with Ecotour Adventures. 
listen, are you reading my mind? <laughs> you just asked us for some owls and river otter footage. We just got some river otter footage today. I didn't have quite enough time to turn it around. And our fall photography workshop has been getting amazing views of a great gray owl and plans, plans a full report when they get back to Jackson. So we'll definitely have those coming up soon uh, for you. So stay tuned, Susan. That's really fun that you gave us that request. And I already have it ready. That's pretty great stuff. I'm pretty proud of myself. But while we're waiting for that great footage, Sarah Wedner, who's very fast becoming a Wildlife Wednesday favorite, has some pretty funny, funny footage that she got in Grand Teton National Park this week. Let's check in with her. Hey everybody, this is Sarah Wedner, your Eco Tour Adventures Guide, and I am back this week to talk to you about my favorite bird, the grouse. Sometimes really funny things happen on tour, and recently it was absolutely no exception to that. I had just finished telling my tour guests how much I love grouse, when one actually landed on the roof of the Eco Tour's van and then waddled its way down onto the hood. I must be the grouse whisperer. The grouse is an amazing bird, and the reason why I love them so much is because the males actually gather in an area called a lek and do a very intricate courtship dance to attract the females every spring. And they'll also puff out their feathers and necks to display beautiful colors. Only a couple of the males that are most impressive will do 90% of all of the mating each season, while all of the other males miss out. What steadily, fellows? There are three main types of grouse in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and that's the dusky grouse, the sage grouse, and the ruffed grouse. Their young will typically leave the nest, believe it or not, within the first day of being hatched, and will fend for themselves for food. The grouse's diet consists of things like leaves, flowers, insects, berries, and pine needles, and in fact they're really well adapted to winter and so they'll survive on those pine needles in the much colder months. Truly an amazing bird, folks, and because we're never afraid to have too much fun over here at Eco Tour Adventures, I'm going to leave you with a video of a grouse in her natural habitat. I cannot watch that without laughing. Thanks very much, Sarah Wedner, for your report. Now guys, of course, we do want to make sure everyone is aware that we always want to maintain an ethical distance from any animal, regardless if it's a grizzly bear or if it's a grouse. Uh, even if that grouse chooses to come too close to us, what we did in that circumstance, Sarah says, is we actually just sort of hung out, had some snacks, had some coffee, and waited for that grouse to make its mind up about leaving our vehicle before departing. Um, so whether it's a grouse or a mouse or a bear, you do want to make sure that you keep wild animals wild. All right, so here's the thing, guys. If you're planning on coming to Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Parks or visiting us here in Jackson Hole in the foreseeable future, I think we just got our summer 2021 schedule set up, our fall photography workshop set up for 2021 as well. Um, if you mention these Wildlife Wednesday weekly roundup broadcasts, we'll give you 10% off when you book. So a lot of you guys have actually, it's been really fun, have been coming out with me specifically with some of the other guides and you're not getting that 10% off because you haven't been asking for it. I do want to make sure everybody's aware of that opportunity because if you plan on coming to see us um, for sure, you know, we'd love to give you um, our great viewers who join us every week a discount so that you can come and meet all of us in person. We'd really love that. That'd be really, really fun. All right. So we actually had a very brief get together with masks last week uh, to go ahead and get a photo. It's an annual tradition of, uh, of ours to get a photo of our whole crew in the fall with the beautiful colors. And I wanted to share this with you guys so that you could see everybody on our team. Don't worry, we had masks on and then we took them off real quick and put them right back on after this photo. Um, but I did want you to see all of these awesome people who've been sending you all these great dispatches from Jackson Hole and Grand Teton. Um, since May, um, all of your favorite Wildlife Wednesday guides are here. We just want to say thank you to you guys. We are really blown away by the amazing support uh, that we have had 
from all of you, how much this broadcast has grown. We just can't say thank you enough. We're incredibly flattered that you choose to spend your time with us and the wildlife in the wilderness of Grand Teton and Yellowstone every week. So from all of us, we really want to say a big thank you for joining us. All right, so it's my second favorite part of the program, which is our trivia question of the week. Now, first things first, we have to answer last week's trivia question. So let me replay that for you. If you think you've got the answer, everybody told me I thought I was really making it hard and everybody said this one was too easy. Um, but if you got the answer, go ahead and comment in the comment section. We've already given away the gift card to our lucky winner. We do that on Tuesdays every week. You have all week to comment to try and win, but we do go ahead and reward it on Tuesday. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show it to you anyway, just so we can see what the heck this is. My question was, is what animal pooped in the woods? This is scat. This is animal poop pretty deep in Grand Teton National Park. What kind of animal uh, made that scat? I'm gonna show it to you one more time because I want you to see something. It's got a lot of berries in it. Does everybody see that? First of all, it's a very large pile of scat. And second of all, it's got a lot of berries. So what animal would be just chowing down on berries right now? Well, I thought I was making this really difficult. Guys, the, the answer to last week's question is, of course, that is bear scat. Now, this time of year, it's a little hard for me to tell whether it's grizzly bear scat or black bear scat. Um, there are ways to differentiate, each, differentiate them from each other, but it's actually really interesting when you read up on uh, bear poop, which... I've spent a fair amount of time doing, it changes greatly from season to season as they change their food resources. So if that bear's been eating meat, they're going to have a very different looking scat than if they've been, for instance, eating berries. So I have no idea. I would suspect based on the heavy forested habitat, maybe a black bear left that scat. Boy, that'd be a big black bear too, but it certainly could have been a grizzly. For all of you guys who got the trivia question correct for last week, good for you. I really thought I was stumping you. Um, apparently I'm just bad at this trivia thing because you all got it right, but I think I've got a good one this week. Week I think I've got y'all stumped. Um, now the way this is going to work is this is this week's trivia question. Now, if you go ahead and answer correctly in the comment section, anytime during this week, whether it's during the live broadcast or if you catch us later, we're going to choose one person to win a $10 gift card in our eco tour store. That's definitely enough to get all sorts of things in the store standalone, like Kira Cassidy's owl stickers, um, Lots of really neat, we've got these cool owl masks. We've got, it's not all owls. Great Prince by Thomas Mangelson and Sue Cedarholm. Amazing books on local wildlife. Uh, if you want to buy this Grand Prismatic, we've got that. Some of my handmade mugs and plates. Some of our naturalist Elise's really cool hats. We started this Eco Tour store um, as a way to pay for our employee health insurance. So if you want to support the Eco Tour team and you like watching us, go ahead and check out that store. Maddie, who's manning our comment section is going to go ahead and put a link up for me uh, telling you all about it to go see if there's something you like. And if you uh, like supporting our health insurance, we sure do appreciate that. The question this week that I'm looking for is what is the research number of the adult bear in this video? So if you know who this bear is, go ahead and comment in the comment section the research number of this bear. And everybody always says I say too much to give it away. So I am not going to say anything this week. I'm just going to have you guys take a look at that video. I'm not going to replay it. I'm trying to make it harder. Um, although you could just rewind the video probably and look at it again. But if you know the research number of that bear, there's going to be some people who watch this every week who are going to go tenly like I don't know who that bear is. Right? Um, because a lot of us are very, very fond of that bear. Um, I've already seen some questions for the question and answer session later about um, that bear. But uh, for those of you guys who might be tuning in, who might be new, you might have no idea who that bear is. So I admit that this question is probably a little skewed towards our return watchers. 
But that's okay. If you're new to watching, we're so happy you've joined us. And this is an incentive maybe for you to tune in next week, right? All right. So if you know the answer, go ahead and give us a comment in the comments section. In the meantime, I am here to answer your wildlife biology and naturalist questions live. So if you have a question for me, go ahead and comment in the comment section. Now, the way this is going to work is I'm going to grab my iPad here um, and I'm going to look at it. So when I'm looking down, I'm sorry to be rude. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking at your questions and answering them as you ask them. So go ahead. Um, oh my gosh. Guys, there's so many of you got the question right. Um, I really need to ask harder questions, I think. All right, we're going to have a real stumper for you next week. You just wait, because I think you're all getting this right. I thought that was going to be hard. All right. Don, are you on this week? Because, Don, you're always telling me my question's too easy. So I want your opinion, because uh, I kind of did this to stump you, Don, if you're, if you're tuning in. So let me know. Let's see here what we've got questions-wise. Fun to see where everybody's tuning in from. This is really cool. Let's see here. Oops, hang on, that was Lessa. Here we go. Linda, the berries look cold, don't they chew the berries? Linda, not really, no. <laughs> so what you were actually seeing in that picture was almost certainly some of the pits from things like choke cherries and service berries, which they just, they just digest and dispose of. They do chew and their stomach does break down the berries, but I don't know if you saw um, that imagery of that grizzly foraging in the first video, but they will literally just take a whole branch and go zip and take the leaves and the berries and sometimes the twig material as well off when they are foraging, both black bears and grizzlies. You'll also see other animals like moose and elk do that too when they're foraging on plant material. They eat it all. So sometimes you will see intact berries, you'll see intact elements of what they were eating um, where you know their body didn't even get a chance to break it all down because they were overloading their digestive system. Right now, because they're in hyperphagia and they're just stuffing their faces with food, um, some of it ends up being a little undigested, uh, but it mostly is those sugars are leading into body fat, which is what's important, which brings us up to, um, the next question, which Lessa had, let me get back up there. Lessa asks, is 399 okay, even though she looks a bit thin? Um, Lessa, yeah, no, she's doing really well. She looks better than she's looked um, in quite some time. I think she looks better now, um, as of this week than she looked this time last year, last fall, where I was pretty concerned. I was really worried about her last fall. And then she went into hibernation and showed up with quadruplets, which just proves that I, um, maybe have a skewed understanding of what an elderly bear should look like because grizzly bears were on the endangered species list for so long. Uh, we didn't really have old grizzly bears in the ecosystem that we could see very often. There's a, a very famous bear in Yellowstone named Scarface who was quite elderly and kind of had the sort of wasted away muscle look that 399 sometimes gives, that skinny face. And when you compared Scarface to younger, fatter bears, it looked like Scarface was really in trouble. And in fact, Scarface was fine. Scarface was just old. We all get old. Think of somebody in their 90s, which is the equivalency of what 399 is. They're not going to have the same muscle um, and fat that somebody who's in their 20s is going to have. And so when you're comparing the two, that's perhaps not quite fair. So the short answer is 399 is looking the best she's looked in quite some time. She's looking very fat. We had a banner year for service berries, which I think really made a difference. In the middle of all that, she had a whole elk carcass to herself. Um, that certainly was really helpful. She's also had some more opportunities to forage on meat as well. So um, she's not looking like she did in her prime, but I think perhaps part of our problem of all of us who are looking at her is our um, views are a little skewed. We don't get to see bears of her age 
in her August appearance very often. And so she looks really skinny to us compared to a younger bear. Now, side note, guys, it is Fat Bear Week. Does everybody know what Fat Bear Week is? Maybe if we're lucky, Maddie might put that up in the comment section for us. The National Park Service puts up a tourney of bears and they uh, are coming out of Katmai National Park. That's a before and after thin versus fat. Hang on. <coughs> Frog in my throat there. And they uh, ask people to vote on who's the fattest bear. So if you want to participate in Fat Bear Week, you should definitely check that out. Let's see here. I'm so in love with Fat Bear Week. Every week it shows up and I'm so excited. Like I love March Madness and the basketball tourney, but the Fat Bear tourney is almost as much fun. So definitely check it out. Oh, Lessa, I'm glad you like your bison gator. We're so excited. That's awesome. Oh my gosh, Allison, you're watching again from Australia. You definitely are a winner from furthest distance away. Uh, watching our program this week. So thanks so much. I don't know what time it is right now in Australia. Tell us in the comment section, but I'm awfully flattered that you're checking out all the amazing wildlife of the Rocky Mountains from so far away. Pretty cool. <laughs> Susan, we pay attention. You thought that was an easy question. All right. I, you know what? I was going to try and stump Don, but now Susan, my goal, I'm going to stump you. So tune in next week. We're going to have a big stumper for you. Don, this is a good question, Don. You, you haven't told me yet whether the question's easy or hard this week, but Don, you're saying the calling of mountain goats in Grand Teton National Park, do they pose a health risk to sheep? Well, clearly you must know based on the question, but I do appreciate you asking because it's a very misunderstood subject. There's a tremendous amount of controversy about it here locally, and I've done my best to provide as much education as I can on this. I'm not um, here to inflict my opinion on you guys here. I'm a wildlife biologist. My job is to give you the facts and let you create your own opinions. Informed decision making, informed opinions are what's so important in all sorts of different places in our culture and society today. What we've got going on in many of our national parks and areas of the Western United States is an overabundance of Rocky Mountain mountain goats. Now, mountain goats are native to much of the Rocky Mountains. For instance, if you go to Glacier National Park up into northern Montana or places in Idaho, that's a great place to see them. That's where they're from. But there's no evidence that says that mountain goats ever lived here in the Teton or Grovant ranges. Um, they were never present in Jackson Hole. There could be a variety of reasons for that, but probably the main reason was because this area was primarily used by bighorn sheep. Now there's a comment concept in wildlife biology um, and it's called the ecological niche. And basically that's a species who lives in a certain area making use of a certain resource occupies a niche. If another species comes in that uses those same resources, then they're gonna compete against each other. For instance, an invasive species might outcompete a native species for their ecological niche. And that's exactly what's going on here. These Rocky Mountain, uh, mountain goats are coming in and they're outcompeting our bighorn sheep herd in the Teton Range. Now, our bighorn sheep herd has had a very, very hard run, particularly in the last 70 or so years. There's a bunch of things all happening to them at once. The first problem was in the 1960s, the Idaho Game and Fish introduced mountain goats into um, a nearby mountain range to um, 
basically expand the amount of hunting that was available for mountain goats in Idaho. Those mountain goats have naturally found their way into Grand Teton National Park. And if you ask me, it actually took longer than I would have expected. When I was a little kid, I didn't really see mountain goats. By the time I was a teenager, we had them in the Snake River Canyon. By the time I was in college, the very first mountain goats were being spotted in the Tetons. And the very first mountain goat to reproduce was in 2005, where we actually saw a baby mountain goat, a kid in the Teton Range. Um, of just a couple years ago, we had um, about 25 mountain goats. Today, we're getting close to over 100, maybe even 150 mountain goats in the Teton Range. Their population is exploding. In the meantime, the bighorn sheep population is crashing. There's a bunch of things going on with bighorn sheep, but the two biggest problems are traditionally bighorn sheep would come down onto the valley floor during the winter months uh, where there's less snow than up high in the Tetons, and they would come um, on one of the buttes on the side of the National Elk Refuge. East and West Grovant Butte is almost certainly where they migrated. But by 1955, with the installation of the state highway and other major road systems, the bighorn sheep could no longer migrate and make that journey. And so they've remained up high in the Teton Range year-round ever since. It's really hard to survive six months of winter high, high in the Tetons, with usually more than 500 inches of snow, and in some cases more than 1,000 inches of snow. That's more than 50 feet of snow. And you know what? You're just, you can't dig under that snow and find food if you're a bighorn sheep. You really do need to be able to migrate into the lower altitudes. But that migration instinct has been lost by the herd. No bighorn sheep from the Teton herd has probably migrated since the late 1960s down onto the valley floor. So that ship has sailed. In the meantime, domestic um, sheep carry a disease that's a type of infectious pneumonia. And this infectious pneumonia is devastating to bighorn sheep. Um, I don't get to use the term uh, decimated very often in the English language. I think decimated means... Does it mean it kills nine out of every 10? I think so, right? That's what decimated means. Well, long story short, on average, 50 to 80% of a bighorn sheep herd is killed by infectious epidemics of infectious pneumonia. And by the way, if you're curious about what a bighorn sheep looks like when they have this pneumonia, which humans cannot get, they've got red eyes, they start coughing pretty violently, and it spreads like wildfire through the herd. There's no question that domestic sheep are the culprit, but for a while there was a lot of confusion because we don't um, have, you know, uh, sheep herders and, and sheep ranchers in Jackson Hole. What we've recently come into to an understanding of is that these mountain goats are carriers of that disease. And so it's no fault of the mountain goats who were reintroduced or not, who were introduced into a place they were never supposed to be, who naturally found themselves into a habitat that was great, great for them only because of the bighorn sheep losing their migratory route. That bighorn sheep population has just plummeted by all of these different circumstances affecting them. And the reason we kind of care beyond the bighorn sheep being really cool in and of themselves, because we do have bighorn sheep in other areas of the Rocky Mountains, is they are a genetically distinct population. So as sheep populations, bighorn sheep populations crashed throughout the Western United States, what would happen is game and fish agencies would find a place where the infectious pneumonia had not affected sheep, they'd take sheep from that location and they'd take them over to an area where they, the sheep had been infected by the pneumonia and the population numbers had become low. As a result, all the bighorn sheep populations in the Western United States are very mixed and there's um, not a lot of genetic uniqueness. The Teton herd, however, remains untouched. It remains pristine. It remains unchanged from how it probably was thousands of years ago with its genetics. And there's a tremendous amount of value to that. We don't want to lose the last of our bighorn sheep. We have less than 100 for sure in the Teton range, probably less than 50 at this point. We don't have 25 years to sit around and make a decision about this. And so the Park Service has decided that they need to remove the invasive mountain goats from the Teton range for the health of the bighorn sheep herd. This has caused a tremendous amount of controversy. People are very, very upset on all sides of the debate. People who don't like to see animals hunted are upset to see these mountain goats who they see as blameless through this affair um, shot. The Wyoming governor is very upset that the National Park Service has hired 
federal agents to go and hunt these animals up high in the Tetons instead of allowing Wyoming citizens to get a mountain goat, which is a once in a lifetime hunting opportunity for them. Um, there's been just a tremendous amount of backlash from people who don't understand why those decisions were made. I'm not here to criticize the Park Service, but I will say they didn't do a very good job educating everybody about what's going on. I'm one of the few people that seems to understand where everybody is coming from. Long story short, the mountain goat hunt was started this spring. They got, I think, 25 in a day. And then um, the governor basically pleaded with the federal government and there was a... Um, a stoppage of the hunt. The, the federal government stopped taking out the mountain goats. And this fall, they're allowing Wyoming citizens to go up high in the Tetons and hunt those mountain goats. Um, I think they've gotten two so far. So it's going to be a much slower process. Um, once again, I'm just giving you the facts. My only concern is that it might go too slow. It's very hard to hunt a mountain goat. You have to hike usually above 10,000 feet. Um, the goats hear and see you coming. They're not dumb animals. <laughs> um, they're very, very smart animals. And so as a result, I'm a little worried that we don't necessarily have as much time as I might hope. Now, I am not advocating for the hunting of mountain goats. I am not advocating for the not hunting of mountain goats. I am telling you guys what the situation is. And I'm telling you guys that it's a very serious issue. Um, so that when you hear about it later, at least you've sort of got sort of a basic understanding of where all sides are coming from. So thank you, Don, for that um, kind of a long explanation. But hopefully you guys found that sort of interesting. Um, it's a big controversy out here in the Tetons and, and a lot of people with a lot of opinions about what's to be done. <laughs> Don says, Tenley, 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 as in my question was way too easy. Don, I'm going to make it harder. You watch. It's going to happen. All right, let's see here. <laughs> your, your nickname's Easy Louisey. Oh, man, you wait for it. All right, Maddie, you just put up the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of decimate. Was I right? I'll have to check it out. Let's see here. How's the moose population, Mike asks. Oh, great question. So, Mike, the population is falling, and that's another controversial, difficult to understand issue. We don't exactly fully understand what's going on with our local moose population. Moose populations are falling throughout the continental United States. We have falling populations in Minnesota and Maine and other areas. Um, this is not the only place, but they seem to be falling uh, for different reasons in different places. And we probably, one of the fun things about wildlife biology is we don't always have all the answers right away. We probably are gonna have a much better idea of what's going on maybe 10 years from now when all the current studies come in. But there's a couple different hypotheses. Um, if you don't like wolves, one of the first things that you're going to point out is that wolves are killing more moose than historically did. They did. And um, yeah, no, they absolutely are. But the thing to remember about wolves is they find the weakest, sickliest, easiest to think, catch thing in their territory. That's their preferred food source. And so if wolves are killing more moose than they did 10 years ago, it's not because they suddenly have developed a taste for moose and they think they just wanna go kill moose instead of elk. It's more likely that moose are weaker than they used to be. And there's something that's making moose more sickly and easier to catch by predators. So while there has been an increased rate of predation, that's certainly not accounting for the dramatic reductions of their population. Um, if moose are more sickly and are having a harder time, that um, gives us some ideas. For instance, moose have slightly more liver flukes, we think, which is a parasite than they historically have, but we didn't do great test studies in the 1950s on liver flukes, so that's a little hard to say. In other areas of the United States, we're seeing massive tick loads on moose. Um, baby moose calves have been found um, that are dead with over a thousand ticks on them, sometimes more. That's enough to drain a baby moose dry. Um, so that's a big concern. Our antelope bitter brush population of um, forage, which moose really heavily rely on, has been stunted and it's much smaller than it historically has been. The elk population is higher than it's historically been. Elk eat antelope bitter brush and that might be affecting the moose population. There's no question that the number of moose being hit by people, by cars, has gone up dramatically in Teton County in the last couple of years. Lots of concern about that. 
Um, we've decreased some speed limits. We're working on some wildlife crossings, but that's definitely a big contributor to the overall problem. So lots and lots of interesting um, questions about moose. One of the most interesting theories I've heard, which it's just a theory, guys. We've got lots of theories out there. I'm not saying this is the cause, but it's an interesting one, is that if you look at early historical documents of early settlers in Jackson Hole, um, they didn't talk about moose very much, which suggests that moose were relatively rare. By the time I was a little girl, we had the highest density of moose in the world. Now our moose population has fallen off again. There is a theory out there that there were too many moose they overate their environment, and now their population has fallen as a result of that because they've stunted that environment. It's an interesting theory. We'll see if it bears any fruit. Um, but great question. My short answer is we don't know why they're falling, but the population is definitely falling. So thanks for that. Let's see here. Did any of you guys see Grizzly Bear 399 and her cubs this week? How am I going to answer this without um, messing things up? Let's just go ahead and say yes. Um, and we have the evidence to prove it. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to say which video has the evidence to prove it. But there might be video evidence somewhere in this broadcast of Grizzly Bear 399. She is doing just fine. The cubs look good. They have been spotted quite a bit this week. Uh, there we go. Was that the best way to answer that without um, messing up what I was doing earlier? I don't know. We'll see. Okay. I think, have I gotten everybody's questions? Oh my goodness. Let's see. I think I got everybody's questions. You guys asked some really great, nice controversial ones this week. If you've got any more questions, you can always ask them in the comment section. I will be looking at that throughout the week. I'm happy to get you some answers. Uh, I really, really appreciate you guys tuning in. I do want to let you guys know that this has been sponsored by the Teton County Travel and Tourism Board, who reminds everybody that we want to be clean, careful, and connected. We want to stay informed with the most up-to-date information at jhcovid.com. COVID cases are rising here in Teton County, so please do use that hand sanitizer. Make sure you're wearing a mask, which is required in the town of Jackson um, and Teton County limits. And uh, guys, it's been such a pleasure spending this Wednesday with you. I hope you all have a wild week, an even wilder weekend. You stay safe, and we'll see you next Wednesday. So long. <laughs>